Hey, welcome to Living Your Best Year Summit. We searched across the globe to find you some amazing experts in their fields. These experts are masters in six different areas. We have psychic medium and intuition, spirituality, health and fitness, relationships, passion, purpose, and profit, along with happiness and well-being, all to help you find and identify your gifts and begin living your soul's purpose. Hi, my name is Naomi Horn, and I'm your host. I'm so honored to have interviewed 30 amazing people all from all around the world, and they're here to share with you their private stories, their proven strategies, and to help you grow and heal and succeed in 2015. This is a free event, so be sure to tell a friend. And if you have any further questions or learn something during this session, please don't hesitate to post it on my fan page at um, facebook.com forward slash Naomi the Educator. And today's professional, her expertise is in holistic health and happiness, and she's a happiness blogger. I'm so excited to have Heidi Heckler. Is that correct, Heckler? I want to make sure I said Hackler, Hackler, Heidi Hackler with us today. She has provided a free gift, so please check out, click the link and check out her free ebook. It's called Kick Your Sugar Habits Before Sugar Kicks You. So that's a wonderful heart of her to be able to give us a free gift for you can learn more about what she does and and how you can live a better life healthy a healthier life so Heidi inspires healthy habits into action through her happiness and wellness blog happywelllifestyle.com and her holistic health coaching practice she receives she received her certification from Institute for integrative nutrition, Heidi continues to expand her knowledge in all things related to herbal medicine and essential oils, foods as medicines, and how do you pronounce this? Ayurvedic. Ayurvedic. Ayurvedic practices. Heidi and, excuse me? Oh, Ayurvedic is just um, ancient Indian. It's oh, like okay. Indian sages. Okay. And Heidi and her husband live aboard their 40 her their 40 foot sailboat where they practice yoga meditation and eating a gluten-free dairy-free diet they try to live the happy well lifestyle by following michael Pollan's um mo model as much as possible eat whole foods not too much mostly plants this is the underlying message of her blog to learn more about heidi and gain access to a wealth of inspiring information please visit her at happywelllifestyle.com so i'm so honored to have her on to give us some information not just about living healthy but um also from being healthy from the inside out because she is definitely practices all that so heidi how are you today i'm great naomi thank you so much for having me i'm really excited to talk with you today I'm so excited as well, you know, especially looking at your blog and you have like such, I mean, so much information on there and so much for people to learn. So uh, we definitely want to talk about all the, all that interesting information you have and what you do as well. So the first thing I want to know is um, I know that you're a holistic health coach or practitioner and um, can you tell us a little bit about what holistic, what that pr approach means to health versus just calling yourself a health and fitness expert? You know, you're Absolutely. So the holistic health part is encompassing the whole body, the whole self. So it would be everything from the food you eat, what you put into your body, as well as things like your friendships, your relationships, your career, your spirituality, your exercise program, kind of everything combined. So, for example, you could eat all organic, vegetarian, or vegan food, but if you hated your husband and you didn't like your job and you didn't have any friends, you would not be healthy because all of those things manifest themselves in different ways in your body. So things like practicing yoga or meditation that help kind of calm you and center mm -hmm. you, um, eating a healthy diet and getting good exercise, and, you know, having some component of spirituality, whether that's just being out in nature and appreciating that or whatever you find as, you know, spirituality. It all ties in together. 
and um, all encompasses like holistic health. So. Oh, okay. So how did you personally, I mean, how did this, what personally happened in your life that guided you to being a, a holistic health, you know, coach? Well, basically, um, I had some different um, issues such as skin issues and digestion issues ongoing for many years that I had gone to all kinds of different doctors and tried to get resolved and nothing was really working. So about 15 years ago, I went to a naturopath and she finally diagnosed me with gluten intolerance and um, allergies to dairy and eggs and told me I had to get all the way off gluten and get off dairy and eggs. And 15 years ago was way before a lot of people really started um, knowing about you know, gluten-free stuff. There were not a lot of gluten-free options out there. So I kind of had to wing it. One of my girlfriends was already diagnosed as celiac before that, so she was a big help to me. But I had to do a lot of research and figure out what I could and couldn't eat. Um, so that was one thing. I had already been a vegetarian for many years before that. And so having to cut out dairy and eggs and gluten basically cut out about half of what I could eat. So that was really difficult for me, but I figured out how to do it. And um, the other thing that really inspired me is that my mom is an herbalist. Um, she became an herbalist back in the early 80s and wow. started her own business. And that was really, she was really cutting edge back then, you know, and we were kind of like, Echinacea, what? What is this <laughs> stuff, you know? <laughs> Nowadays, of course, almost everyone's heard of echinacea, but back then we thought my mom was a little bit crazy, and I feel badly that we, you know, kind of cut her, didn't cut her much slack, but um, we all came around to see that mom was wise in her ways, and she knew what she was doing, and she had always been into a lot of different alternative medicine, um, acupuncture, and, you know, getting regular massage and stuff like that, which I wholeheartedly agree with and do myself now. I get mm -hmm. regular acupuncture and massage all the time, which I think helps encompass the whole health being so basically those two things dealing with my own food allergy issues and then having that background from my mom in holistic medicine um, kind of just really inspired me and so for a long time I was going to alternative doctors for things mm -hmm. if I did get sick or needed something and then a lot of my friends as they also became diagnosed with food allergies or celiac disease or gluten intolerance or even if they got a cold or a flu they would call me and be like what should I take what should I do because they kind of knew that I was interested in that and um, so I yeah I didn't really intend to go to school for that but I went back to school a couple of years ago and um, got a certificate in holistic health and nutrition because it kind of just seemed like everything was coming together in that direction for me. Wow. That's that's great. So how did, I mean, because, you know, when I just think of like, oh, if I'm going to hire a coach, someone to help me with my health, I'm, I'm thinking like really like, okay, just show me what kind of, what are good foods to eat and exercise re regimens. How do you approach when you're working with a client, how is your approach a little different than what maybe people may perceive a coach would do? Well, I think I look at the whole picture. Um, I do, I mean, I am coaching a few clients, but predominantly I am really doing my blogging as a way to get the message out to more people because okay. coaching, you're just kind of one on one. And with my blog, I can reach a much wider audience. Mm -hmm. So I think with the variety of things that I'm posting about on there. But when I am working with clients, you know, I look at the whole big picture. I look at their sleep pattern and what may be causing if they're not sleeping well. Like one one client I'm working with right now, he was having a terrible time sleeping. And so the first thing I did was ask him about his caffeine consumption. And it turns out he was drinking coffee all day long and having his last cup of coffee at like five o'clock at night. And I was like, well, it's no wonder you can't go to sleep. You know? <laughs> it's like, try cutting out all coffee afternoon and see what happens. And so he tried that. And afternoon, if he wanted to have a cup of coffee, he'd make sure it was decaf. And lo and behold, a couple of days later, he was sleeping a lot better. So I think that a lot of people just don't really think. They don't put two and two together, yeah. and they just think, oh, my gosh, I can't sleep. But they don't look back and see, what is it I'm doing? You know, Am I drinking too much caffeine? Am I eating too much sugar? Am I not getting enough exercise? Am I just go, 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 go all day long, and my brain doesn't have time to decompress and slow down? So I look at a lot of things. I look at 
you know, people's digestion. There's many, many, many people have food allergies that go undiagnosed. There's a um, one statistic says that about 75% of everyone has a food allergy that they are unaware of. And so a lot of food allergies don't necessarily manifest themselves in a way that you could tell. Like maybe you just get random headaches now and then and you mm -hmm. just think, well, I just always get headaches. I don't know what that's about, but I take an aspirin and okay, you know, gone. It could be that it's a food that you ate that caused that. Um, it could be that you don't have any outward symptoms, but that it's actually doing things internally to you, whether it's to your digestive system or it's causing leaky gut syndrome or different things like that. And so over time, when you have a food allergy, if you have a food allergy that you're unaware of, every time you eat that food, your body's immune system is kind of going on attack and it's going, whoa, okay, there's some gluten. I got to go fight that thing, you know? And so your, your body's army kind of all gets geared up and they go out and fight. And then the next time you eat that thing, they go out and fight again. And so what happens over time is your immune system gets worn down. And so then if you come in contact with some pathogen, a flu or cold virus, or even, you know, cancer, your body's immune system might be too worn down to be able to go and attack that properly and get rid of it. So it's one of the reasons why it's important to really pay attention to your food and what you're eating. And if you do have a sensitivity or an allergy, to get that diagnosed. Um, a good way to go about that is doing an elimination diet. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I do with my clients is have them keep a food diary for two weeks, and I try to do a food and mood diary, so write down all the foods you're eating, and write down your moods, are you happy, are you sad, are you angry, are you upset, you know, how do, how do you feel throughout the day, and then can you correlate that to any of the foods you're eating, and it's surprising to see that, especially with sugar, and sugar is one of my big areas of, um, I guess, expertise, um, partly because I was totally addicted to sugar, mm -hmm. and most Americans are totally addicted to sugar, yes. But once you cut sugar out of your diet, it's just amazing. Like pounds will drop off of you and you will feel so much better. So, And then in, okay. in your book that you gave you, that the kick your sugar habits before mm -hmm. the sugar kicks you, do you talk about, because, you know, a lot of times when I, I read stuff like that, they give you the, okay, cut this out and put this in. But because you're saying it's an addiction, how do you deal with the process of, you know, dealing with the mindset when it comes down to kicking that habit that you've had, you know, it for is, most people all your life because it's in so many different things. Exactly, it is. It can be really difficult for some people, and I think it partly depends on if you have that addictive type personality, then it mm -hmm. may be more difficult for you to actually kick that habit. For me, what actually did it was information and education, and when I realized you know, that the average American is eating, you know, like a half a pound of sugar a day or something like that. Mm. I mean, that was just shocking to me. And I wasn't eating anywhere near that amount. But there's so many things that are now being tied directly to sugar, including cancer, heart disease, diabetes. I mean, most people are aware that sugar can cause diabetes. But yeah. heart disease is a new one that's just been linked within the past couple of years. And cancer, the thing that's so amazing to me there. For example, my mother um, was diagnosed with breast cancer about 15 years ago, and when she got her diagnosis, her doctor told her that the cancer had been growing in her for anywhere from about 10 to 12 years already before it was diagnosed, mm -hmm. and hers was caught when it was very small. It hadn't spread anywhere at all, so that was very lucky, but the fact that it had been growing in her already for, you know, 10 plus years, and the other thing that we learn is that all of us have cancer cells growing in us at any given time. We mm -hmm. all might have eight to 10 cancer masses growing in us all the time. But again, that goes back to our immune systems. If your immune system is healthy and strong, your T cells, which are your part of your cancer fighting cells in your body, they will go out, find that cancer, attack it and eradicate it. And okay, that's gone. But if your immune system is weakened, then you're not, they're not able to go out and get rid of that cancer. So just knowing that all of us have 8 to 10 cancers growing in, in us at any given time is kind of a scary thought. And then when I found out that cancer cells have eight times the sugar receptors that normal cells have, so cancer cells totally feed on sugar, 
And in fact, if you get diagnosed with cancer and you have a PET scan done so Mm -hmm. that they can scan your body and see where the cancer goes, they use sugar water to detect where the tumors are because the sugar goes straight to the cancer cells. So for me personally, getting over my sugar addiction, I just used my brain and education and just thought, oh my gosh, every time I'm eating something with sugar, it is fueling those cancer cells that are already in me. And I don't want that. So that for me was enough to go, whoa, I, you know, I, I'm just not going to eat that thing. And it's not to say I don't have any sugar. Um, I'm addicted to dark chocolate, Mm -hmm. but I will make sure that it's over 72% dark, which doesn't have very much sugar in it. And I don't mind bitter chocolate. I actually will eat 100% dark chocolate. (laughs) um, You know, I don't love it, but it's not bad. Uh, My favorite is 88% dark. So that's pretty dark, and it doesn't have very much sugar in it. So so when you say sugar, it's it's – the natural sh- are the natural sugars good that we we consume in our bodies, or it's just any sugar? Well, so that's a good question. Um, added sugars are definitely worse for you. So anything that has sugar added, and I think that the FDA is currently working on updating the um, labels on food, so it's actually going to have to start saying added sugar on it. So um, all sugars in general are not great for your body. When humans evolved and developed thousands of years ago, we didn't eat very much sugar at all. It was very rare. You know, as hunter-gatherers, we would come across fruits and berries only during certain seasons of the year, and we would just eat a little bit of them. We might come across honey every once in a while, but we'd have to get through the beehive to get that add mm-hmm. that honey. So we just didn't evolve to eat a ton of sugar, and it has only been really in the past hundred years that we have started eating sugar so much and it's very hard on the body the pancreas is not used to digesting it and so in the united states today 50 percent of all americans are diabetic i mean that's just a horrifying wow. thought 50 percent are diabetic another probably 25 percent are pre-diabetic and there's um you know, you don't you don't even have to be overweight to be diabetic or pre-diabetic. There's totally skinny people that could even almost look anorexic, but if all they do is eat sugar, then um, their pancreas could be, you know, totally out of whack. Their hormones get out of whack. The insulin just can't work properly. And so um, I think fruit is great for you. There's a lot of good benefits to fruit. There's all kinds of phytonutrients and vitamins and things like that. And, you know, again, I think eating a couple pieces of fruit a day is great for you. But if you're doing juicing, like just fruit juice, that's a lot of sugar as well. Even though it's natural sugar, for example, an 8-ounce glass of orange juice has more sugar in it than a Coke. Wow. And an 8-ounce glass of orange juice is equivalent to eating about 8 oranges. Well, who would ever sit down and eat 8 oranges, you know? Nobody. (laughs) And if you did you would at least have the pulp and some of the other things to help your digestive system break it down more slowly. But when you're just drinking a glass of orange juice, um, you're basically just mainlining sugar right into your bloodstream, and it's causing your blood sugar to spike and crash. And So one of the interesting things for me personally is that when I was so addicted to sugar and carbs and ate that stuff all the time, I needed to snack all day long because my blood sugar was always going down. I didn't really realize it, but Mm -hmm. I was like, every two hours I had to have something to eat or I would be really cranky. My husband would be like, oh gosh, she's got the (laughs) cranks again. Feed her quickly, you know? (laughs) So ever since I've been really mostly off of sugar except for a little bit of dark chocolate, I don't need to snack anymore. Like, I don't even get hungry, you know? I just, because my blood sugar is not doing this all day long. It's just staying more even keel, and so I can just eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner and not have snacks, which helps keep weight off and, you know, is easier on your digestive system as well. So so I, so you, you say, like, you know, pretty much you're spending a lot of your time blogging to get the information out there um, and, you know, reading some of your, some of the blog sites and, I mean, some of the articles that you've written on your blog – Um, you give like really good information, but I think I was thinking like, okay, why is it that, why are there so many people having a sugar addiction? And it seems like to me, it's, 
you know, education, we, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of education out there. There's a lot of books out there. There's a lot of the, uh, information out there for people, but it seems like there's some type of emotional connection that's preventing people to really hearing what's being said. Cause like you're, you're, you just gave like a lot of information and some, and people could be like, yeah, you're right. Oh yeah, I understand. But then give me that candy bar. exactly. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking like, that's why I like the whole, the concept of what you're saying, the holistic point of view, because right. you, you know, getting down to connecting to the emotional um, components that goes along with that. Um, have you noticed where, you know, working with people, have you noticed that there are like, common things, a common thread that people tend to have when it comes down to like now wanting to break it or, you know, with our, you know, with our mindset or anything like that, how you, you know, working with different people, how you found any commonalities? Um, well, you know, one of the things with sugar addiction is sugar is eight times more addictive than cocaine. So it's definitely, wow. it is really addictive. And it also, it highlights the same pleasure centers in your brain that drugs do. So, I mean, it's definitely an addiction and a lot of people, you know, some people could do a drug one time and not get addicted, whereas other people can't. And sugar is sort of the same way in that regard. Um, one of the other things that I found when I was in nutrition school that I thought was so fascinating is that your taste buds regenerate every 7 to 10 days. So you have all completely brand new taste buds every 7 to 10 days. And they kind of say that the taste buds hijack the whole body because it tastes great you just want more. And between the taste buds and the brain, it's kind of this like, mm -hmm. gimme, 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 you know, even though your brain might know it's not good for you, but the taste buds like, oh, but it tastes so good. I want more of that. Um, so if you can get people off of sugar, even for like a week or 10 days, then their taste buds have regenerated. And so when they do eat something sweet, they will notice it's way sweeter. Wow. So a couple different clients of mine, um, two clients in particular, one I worked with, um, I've worked with her over the past year, and she's lost over 80 pounds in the past year. And she was pretty addicted to sugar, and I tried, you know, working with her to get her off of it. And, um, one, a rule of thumb is that you shouldn't have more than 26 grams of added sugar a day. And so she was kind of like counting all her sugar grams and going, <laughs> I've had 24, that means I can have two more, you know? And I was like, well, no, that's like a maximum. You really want to strive to have less than that. And so, you know, gradually we got her to eat less and less by kind of adding in more fruits and more sweet vegetables, root vegetables, like if people like beets or carrots or fennel, those things all taste really sweet on the taste bud as well and can kind of help um, trick your tongue into thinking that it's getting a treat. But anyway, once she finally, you know, got off of sugar for a couple weeks and um, I think for her, the thing was she got diagnosed with high blood sugar, which was borderline diabetes. Mm -hmm. And she just realized, wow, I really don't want to get diabetes. I really need to do something. And for some people, it may take something really drastic like that. You know, they may have to be diagnosed with an illness before they wake up. But I think if you can get them off sugar for a week or two, once they do have it again, they realize, wow, that is so sweet. And one of my clients was drinking a lot of sweetened drinks every day, and we kind of tapered her back, you know, maybe replace one sweetened drink with water every day, and then the next week replace two sweetened drinks with water and just keep trying, you know, gradual things. And so finally she was pretty much off of sweetened drinks, and then she told me she went out to a restaurant and she ordered a lemonade, and she said it was so sweet she couldn't even drink it. She had to water it way down. And But, you know, whereas a month before, she would have drank the whole thing down no problem. So it really is about working with your taste buds and your brain and just kind of resetting that mm -hmm. baseline as to what is sweet. And for me now, like, I well, I, um, I turned 50 last January. I had a big 50th birthday party, and my girlfriend made all these gluten-free cupcakes and I was like, oh, awesome, I'm going to have a cupcake, you know. And I took one bite, and I about just went into a shock. <laughs> it was so much sugar, I couldn't even eat it. I mean, one bite, and I was done. And that was just because my taste buds had been reset. And I was like, wow, way too much sugar. So wow. I just try to work with people in ways to get them 
to add more things in, add more fruits and sweet vegetables in, and try to cut back on sugar where they can. And sometimes it takes several months, you know, but over time, people are um, generally able to kick sugar out. And if they can stay off of it, that's the other key thing, is because once you start eating it again, you just want more, 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 more. And I've even found that for myself, you know, if I have a cookie now, and then tomorrow I want two cookies, and the next day I want three cookies or whatever, and it's all just your tongue totally kind of messing with you, you know? (laughs) Jacking your brain. (laughs) It is, completely, yeah. So, um, I was going to ask you about the gluten-free, because I think, I mean, that's like one of those um, food allergies that I I think a lot of people have and don't know it, but now it's like a, a major thing you know, people having to eat gluten-free, having a gluten-free diet as well. So um, do you know where this, why now? Why all of a sudden now? that's a great question, and I do know why now. This is amazing. (laughs) I've actually been learning a lot about it recently. So one thing is that um, GMO aside, we have hybridized all of our wheat in this country, and it started back in about the 1950s. And the scientists were working with the farmers to try to figure out how to grow more wheat, more wheat. And at the same time, they were also seeing that people loved their really fluffy, chewy breads. And so what makes breads fluffy and chewy is gluten in it. And gluten is a protein. And so people who have either celiac disease or a gluten intolerance basically don't have the proper enzymes to be able to break down that protein. Mm -hmm. And so then it can wreak havoc in your system. So what happened back in the 1950s is, along with the help of the government and a bunch of scientists, they hybridized all these different wheats to have more and more and more gluten in them. And so the wheat that we are eating today is entirely different than it was even 50 years ago, and it has Mm. maybe 10 times the amount of gluten in it that it used to have. So the other thing that happened is prior to about 100 years ago, all breads that were made were pretty much fermented. They were some type of sourdough bread. That was because we didn't have a refrigeration process. And so as people made their breads and set their dough out to rise or whatever, the fermentation process would start. And so sourdough breads that you had like back in the gold miner days and things like that, it turns out that the actual fermentation process of the sourdough bread breaks down the gluten protein and gets rid of it. So... Prior to about 100 years ago or even maybe 80 years ago, people were not ingesting very much gluten at all. You know, we didn't eat a lot of pastas and grains and things. They would have a little bit of bread, but mostly people ate meat and vegetables and, you know, grains were more of a side type of thing. So since the 1950s, not only are we putting wheat and gluten type of, you know, additives into every single type of processed food out there, but it's got 10 times the gluten in it that it used to have, and we don't have that sourdough or fermentation process to break down the gluten and get rid of it, so our bodies have really just been bombarded with gluten in the past 50 years, and that is why there's such an increase in gluten sensitivity, Mm. so great question. Yeah, because I'm just like, now it's just uh, so many. So when you, because some people have say, okay, my gluten-free diet is, I'm just going to buy a whole bunch of products that are gluten-free. Right. Do you think that's a good idea or a gluten-free yeah. diet should be mainly, <laughs> you know, the whole food, whole fruits yeah. and vegetables? Exactly. So my take on the gluten-free diet is I don't think that it's very wise to substitute all your breads and cereals and crackers and cookies with gluten-free versions of those because unfortunately gluten-free foods actually don't taste that great and so generally what they do to make them taste better is guess what they put in lots of sugar (laughs) so you're getting different types of processed grains and a lot of sugar and a lot of other processed chemicals and crap in there that your body doesn't need and so my take on being gluten-free is that I just pretty much try to cut out all simple carbohydrates which are processed grains cereals things like that I just don't really eat that stuff Um, I will eat some whole oats on occasion or maybe um, steel-cut oats 
Um, the thing with oats is oats themselves do not contain gluten, mm -hmm. but almost all the oats in this country are processed in the same facilities that process wheat, and so they get cross-contaminated. So there's a couple companies out there like Bob's Red Mill that makes gluten-free oats. Um, so if you want to have, you know, oatmeal for breakfast or something like that, I would say doing the steel-cut oats and getting the gluten-free ones is an option there. But in general, I just try to not eat that many cereals um, and grains. If I'm going to have grains, I would have either brown rice or even like uh, black rice or wild rice, something like that, or quinoa is a great grain. Quinoa is a full, complete protein in itself, so it's the only grain out there, I believe, that's a complete protein. Um, amaranth is another ancient grain that does not have gluten in it. And there's some other ones like millet. But in general, I think that um, the more I read about carbohydrates and things like that, I think that Americans in particular and Western Europeans just eat far more carbohydrates than we need. And anytime you eat a carbohydrate, it gets broken down into sugar in your bloodstream. So even though it's a little bit different type of sugar than eating straight, you know, refined sugar, mm -hmm. it still ultimately turns to sugar and, you know, spikes your blood sugar kicks on that insulin and so um, I just try to not eat a lot of carbohydrates other than what are found naturally in fruits and vegetables and a little bit of grains here and there mm -hmm. so I, I was reading on your on your blog site how you know it was pretty much a gradual change it wasn't something you like one day I'm kicking everything right. you know so I, which is good you know it's good for people to know like you know you didn't just one day wake up and say I'm going to kick everything <laughs> that it was, you know, gradually, you know, you stop doing this one and stop uh -huh. doing the next one and, and everything like that. So with that, what do you think if people are listening, they're saying like they're having either ailment problems or fatigue problems or whatever the problems are they're having, and they know that they want to begin the process of changing their, their diet. Where, um, what, what do you think are good resources out there that they could go t to, to begin that's the process. A really, that's a great question. Um, so one of the books I really have liked reading is called Clean Gut. It's by Dr. Alejandro Younger. And he basically talks about the whole flora and fauna in the gut as sort of the starting point to fixing a lot of our um, health and wellness issues. Anything from fatigue to um, insomnia to, you know, different um, skin rashes or, you know, all kinds of different digestive issues. And so in his book, he does a 21 day clean gut diet that includes recipes. And it basically gets you almost all the way off of sugar and, uh, processed carbohydrates. He has a few carbohydrates in there. Um, the only fruit he has you eating are berries because berries are really low on the glycemic index as far as sugar content. And then um, he has, you you know, he can eat quinoa a couple times a week, but it's lots of vegetables and then healthy forms of protein such as fish or free range chicken, grass fed beef or um, wild game meat, you know, elk, deer, mm -hmm. bison, things like that. And his recipes are really delicious. I was a little bit surprised because I, my husband and I got the book and my husband does all the cooking in our family, which is so lucky for me. <laughs> Um, but with guidance from me, I'll say, Hey baby, why don't we have this, you know, and he'll, so he'll make whatever for dinner. He tries out a lot of recipes for me that I later blog about. And so when we looked through that book and we were like, Oh my gosh, this is going to be cutting out a lot of stuff. And, but we started trying the recipes and they are so delicious that we actually make the recipes all the time, even when we're not doing that diet. So I think that's a really great place to start. Because the book is a really fun and entertaining read, for one. So it's interesting. It's captivating. He gives you a whole plan right there, and he gives you recipes to go with it. So I've recommended that to most of my clients, and um, most all of them have done it and have really good success with that. Mm -hmm. So it's also a good way to lose a few pounds if you have just like an extra, you know, 5 or 10 pounds hanging around. Like when I we did that 21-day diet, I lost 10 pounds right there, and I didn't really need to lose weight. It was sort of like that 10 extra pounds that you just always have. And so I lost that and was able to keep it off, which is always a nice thing, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that's, um, that's a really good resource. Okay. And Thanks. then the other thing is on my website, if you go to happywelllifestyle.com, 
under my resources section, I have a library page there, and I have a whole bunch of books and videos there that people can um, check, you know, look at and find out more information on holistic health and wellness. Oh, that's perfect. Because one, just go to her her website, and then that's going to at least give you, you know, yeah. it's a, it's the, it's the window to to learning about all the other things as well. Okay. So that's great. So last thing before we go, um, what do you think? What do you think are the benefits of, you know, living a holistic life outside of oh you have better health? But what are other benefits to it? Well, I think the the biggest benefit for me is um, feeling really energetic and happy all the time. I mean, most of the time, you know, of course, you have days when you get down or whatever. Mm. Um, but I think I've been meditating for about 25 years and I think that helps really center me and keep me grounded. And, you know, if I do have a day where things are going haywire, I kind of just like tune inward a little bit and try to let that stuff go. Don't let it bother me. I, you know, I definitely don't always do that. There's some days when some driver will cut me off and I'll be like, ah! <laughs> but then I like, wait a minute. Okay. Maybe he's having a worse day than I am trying to cut him some slack or, you know, whatever it is. But I think having, you know, good energy, I mean, I'm 50 years old and I feel like I have, you know, probably almost more energy now than I had when I was 25 and eating lots of junk food and mm -hmm. crap. And um, you don't even look 50. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you. You look good. That's, that's my secret. Meditation, <laughs> yoga, holistic eating. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention really quickly, too, with the diet things is eating healthy fats is really great for you, like avocados and nuts and seeds and um, coconut oil is really great for you. All those healthy fats not only help fuel your brain because your brain is actually 75% fat, so you need healthy fats to fuel your brain, but they also help keep you really satiated throughout the day and they help just keep your energy up because fats take a lot longer for you to digest. So if you make sure you have some healthy fats with all your meals, then they take longer to digest, which means your food is kind of sticks with you, sticks to your ribs longer and mm -hmm. um, keeps you full throughout the day but I do think you know eating organic um, staying away from GMOs for sure and then the other thing that I learned in school and I don't think I have a link on my blog but maybe after this interview I'll actually go put the link up there um, people don't realize that our health and beauty products are not regulated by the FDA you know I think people think if they go into the drugstore or they go into the grocery store and they buy a shampoo or lotion or whatever it might be that it's been vetted and that is not the case at all on the FDA's own website they state right there that they do not regulate health and beauty products and there are something like about maybe between five and six thousand known toxins that are in our health and beauty products wow. people are not aware of that and a lot of those toxins and chemicals have been banned in all over Europe and in the EU and in Canada but they're still used in our products here today because the pharmaceutical companies you know kind of strong arm everybody and what people don't maybe realize is that 60% of anything you put on your skin goes directly into your bloodstream. So if you're putting on a cream or a lotion or using a shampoo that has toxic chemicals in it, that is being directly absorbed through your skin and right into your bloodstream. So there's a great website out there where you can check all your health and beauty products. It's called skindeep.org. And you can just type in the name of whatever health and beauty product and it will show you right there the toxicity level of how toxic or non-toxic it is and i'll put a link to that up on my website oh, as well definitely because so, yeah i mean when you think about health you sure not thinking about what you're putting on your your body no, and you put lotion or some type of cream on your body yes. every day for most people do yeah and to know wow that so thanks for that that's yeah. really, you know, really informative. and especially for kids too i think it's even more important for like teenage girls and young girls who are trying all the different health and beauty products and putting in all, you know, all those toxins going right into their body is directly affecting their hormones and messing them up. And girls are getting their periods younger and younger mm -hmm. ages nowadays. And that's been linked to a lot of the toxic chemicals in health and beauty products that really mess up the hormonal system inside of young girls and can carry that on through even into their adulthood. And there's been some indication that it can even cause like birth defects in their children you know 10 years later or something like that wow. so there's a lot of compelling reasons out there to just really 
get educated, educate yourself and know not only what you're putting in your body, but what you're putting on your body, know what you're doing. And because the government is not looking out for you. Corporations are not looking out for you. You've got to look out for yourself. Yeah, yeah. that's important. So thank you for that. Cause, um, I, I wasn't even thinking about that, you know, yeah, more or less food, but yeah. So thanks for that. Yeah. So before we go, um, I, you know, all, all I like to say is anybody who's doing positive, spreading positivity out there and making sure that, you know, we're able to live a better, happier, healthier life. I definitely want to um, be of service to you as well. So what can we do to service you and to make sure that we get the word out of what you're doing and what you're, you know, all the positive things that you're, you're letting the viewers know about? Well, thank you, Naomi. That's really great. Um, if people just want to go to my blog and check it out, happywelllifestyle.com, you can sign up for my free e-newsletter. There's a little sign-up box in the top right corner of my blog. And then you'll get my free ebook on helping kick your sugar habit. And also you'll get weekly newsletters with health and wellness tips and tricks and recipes. I put a lot of good recipes up there. I have a lot of gluten-free recipes on my blog if people are looking for that. So if you um, sign up for my newsletter and subscribe to that and then send it on to your friends and family that you think might be interested and spread the word about things like, you know, your health and beauty products and send, send that website skindeep.org to all your friends and family and you know tell them hey did you know this because I think a lot of people just don't know and people no. are so busy with their daily lives their work and taking care of their kids and so I sort of hope that my purpose in life is to help you know share a lot of this information and make it really easy and accessible for people to learn more about what they should and shouldn't be putting in their bodies and on their bodies and how they can stay healthier and, and ultimately happier Yes, thank you for that as well, that we have people out there like you who are willing to, you know, spread the word and let us know about all those things. And um, thank you again, Heidi, for being a part of Living Your Best Year Summit. I so appreciate and I'm honored to have you on and sharing all the wealth and knowledge that you have. And for those viewers, if even if you have um, some websites or some key things that um, can also spread the word of, you know, just living a healthier, happier life, a lifestyle, you know, please post it on the fan page, on my fan page, facebook.com forward slash Naomi, the educator, and let us know about it. And we can surely pass it on to Heidi because she has a lot of wealth of information on her blog site. And, you know, the more that she can add and in, in to spread the word to other people, the more the merrier. So even post that if, if something connects to you. You know, be sure to um, listen in to more experts and what they have to offer and share in your inbox. Some more will be coming as well. So until next time, this is Naomi Horn, your host. Peace and blessings. Thank you, Naomi. Namaste. You're welcome.